Hello everyone, Samuel Patel, founder and CEO of Sohicom, which is an online social learning game designed to improve students' math skills. Now, before I get started, I want to just see by a show of hands here, how many people in the audience have actually went through the US K-12 education system as a student? Okay, so a good portion of you, and you survived. I did too. Uh, now, how many of you didn't raise your hand because Maybe you're too uncomfortable saying that you went through the U.S. education system. <laughs> okay. I know there's some of you over here. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about why I believe that in the next 10 years, games are going to positively transform the way K-12 students learn, both in and out of the classroom. I'll repeat that. I believe that in the next 10 years, games are going to positively transform the way K-12 students learn, both in and out of the classroom. And to clarify, when I'm saying games, I'm referring specifically to digital games. So video games, online games, um, computer games, and mobile games. Now, you might be thinking that these games have been around for decades, right? They haven't transformed K-12 education. Why will it happen now? Well, because I'm telling you it will. <laughs> okay, that's not why. Um, but I believe this transformation will occur for four major reasons. First, today's kids play games more than ever. Second, next generation teachers play games more than ever. Third, technology advancement. And fourth, the benefits that games can bring to learning. So I'm going to talk more about these four reasons, but I'm going to spend the most of my time on this talk um, elaborating on the final reason, the benefits, which I find the most compelling. So first, today's kids play games more than ever. Now, from an early age, young kids now are engaged in playing games more so than in any other period in human history. That's pretty powerful. And the level of engagement these kids are experiencing in games is significantly higher than what they experience in the classroom. And as a result, students are becoming disengaged in classroom learning. And over time, this will fuel the use of games to re-engage these students back in the classroom. Second reason, next generation teachers play games more than ever. Now the new teachers that have come out in the last decade and those that will come out in the next decade will not only have played more games themselves as kids, but they'll be playing more games as adults than any other period of teachers in our country's history. Third, technology advancement. Thanks to Moore's Law, the reduction of costs concurrent with technology advancements will finally provide the infrastructure to support game-based learning implementations in the classroom. And fourth, the benefits that games can bring to learning will be too significant and too valuable to simply disregard. Now, I want to elaborate some more on this, and I'm going to spend the majority of the rest of my talk um, on discussing the various traits and the mechanics um, and the benefits of, of games. But to begin, I want to share a relevant experience I had about five years ago teaching math at an after-school program in an underperforming school in South Phoenix. Now, as part of this program, I worked with at-risk students, and I used games to provide math instruction. And the students we had in our program were enrolled in the elementary school where we offered the tutoring. Now, a few weeks into the program, I realized that there was a fourth grade girl that was coming to our program, but she wasn't attending school, so she was ditching. When I found out, I thought to myself, are you kidding me? This is a fourth grade student. Students that young aren't supposed to be ditching school, right? And so I wanted to talk to her. I wanted to find out why she was skipping school. And she told me that she was bored. She didn't like school. She also mentioned some not so nice things about her teacher. Um, and similarly, I had asked her what motivated her to come to our after school math tutoring program. Well, she thought it was really cool that we used games. And it didn't really feel like she was learning, even though there was a significant amount of content she was learning. Now, this was a transformational experience for me. Um, and it caused me to ask this much larger question. Why is it that kids give up so quickly or become disengaged when facing a tough math problem, or any problem for that matter? Yet these same kids can play games for hours, right? And even though they may repeatedly fail, they somehow persevere 
and eventually succeed. What is it about games that causes this? So to answer that question, I want to talk about three of the most desirable traits exhibited by game players. <laughs> High engagement. So this is a picture of a young boy playing a video game. It's taken by the photographer Robbie Cooper as part of this project, Immersion, where he wanted to show just how focused and engaged young video game players can be. Game players become deeply immersed in knowledge building and problem solving through the act of playing games. The next desirable trait is perseverance. Good games encourage players to explore and learn by discovery through minimizing the fear of failure. And this fosters creativity, allowing players to come up with unanticipated and profound solutions to problems. And finally, the last desirable trait is the desire to improve. Game players want to get better, right? They're highly productive people that are willing to put in the effort and do the hard work in order to achieve a meaningful objective. Now, would it be awesome if these traits were shown by students learning math, or any other subject for that matter? Well, for the past four years, I've been working to answer this question and use what I learned to the development of SokiCom, which is an online social learning game to teach students math skills. Now, as part of that work, I've identified three core game mechanics which lead to these desirable traits, which would be great to have in people. So I'm going to talk about these three core game mechanics. They're social, personalization, and progression. So let's start with social. Games that are social or have social communities built around them lead to much higher engagement and immersion. <clears throat> and this can be seen in games such as City Book, which has over 100 million players. I've also seen this in studies that we performed with team-based multiplayer games to learn math in the classroom. Now, in these games, students within a team would work with one another in real time and they'd collaborate to solve math problems while they compete against another team. And there was something that was really, really interesting that happened in these multiplayer games, which I call social obligation. And this is where, when a student, being on a team, makes a student care even more about their performance. Because now their performance doesn't just impact themselves individually, but it impacts the entire team. So they feel more responsible to perform well. They feel intrinsically like it's their duty to contribute to the team. And this is extremely powerful because students are motivated to spend more time practicing and improving their own skills. Now, not to the same extent, but an example of how this is being practiced in the classroom is project-based learning. And project-based learning is an educational approach where students work in groups and are given a project with real-world context. Teachers assign the project to the students and then let the students learn through the process of inquiry. Multiple studies have shown that project-based learning has led to increased student achievement. However, these same studies also noted that there were significant challenges with large-scale implementation of project-based learning. And specifically, this deals with the lack of individualized support that students need when they're working on their project. This is where games come in. Through the second core mechanic of personalization, games have the ability to address this issue. So let's talk more about personalization. Games have the ability to personalize the experience and provide challenges at the appropriate level of difficulty for the player, which is very similar and in line with the zone of proximal development, where games are challenging enough to be stimulating, but not too challenging where you feel it's unachievable. A great example of an online role-playing game that emulates this is RuneScape. And in RuneScape, you're given missions that are appropriate to your skill level that you can complete at your own pace. And even if you happen to get stuck on one of these missions, there's individualized support that you'll receive through help features. Now, not to the same extent, but differentiated instruction is an example of how some classrooms are implementing the personalization mechanic. And differentiated instruction is an approach to teaching where teachers are providing individualized instruction for each of the students. 
The big challenge with differentiated instruction, of course, as you might imagine, is that with one teacher and 20 or 30 students, it doesn't become feasible to be able to tailor the instruction and to personalize instruction for each student. This, again, is where games come in and can provide significant value. Now, the last mechanic, progression. Games have the ability to provide an extensive reward system to make players feel like they're really making progress through earning achievements, badges, rewards, level ups, all these type of things. And players love this, right? I mean, they absolutely love this kind of stuff. And it's not the case that education doesn't implement this, that it's not in schools. Um, schools do implement this in limited fashion. And some examples of this, for instance, are when a student graduates, you know, hooray, yippee, um, progressing to the next grade level, or when a student passes a test, preferably with a good grade. Another example could be something as simple as getting a very cool looking smiley face sticker on your homework assignment. However, these are all limited. Games, on the other hand, have the ability to provide a much more extensive reward system that rewards players at every micro action they take toward the achievement of a learning objective. Now, you might be thinking that, okay, games sound a bit promising, but how is this all going to work? And what's going to happen to the teacher? So, some thoughts on what I've seen work in the classroom. Games will play a big part in education, but they won't be the only way. There'll still be teacher-led instruction, there'll still be other forms of assignment and practice. And we absolutely still need the teacher. I agree with Salman Khan of the Khan Academy's approach, where rather I see the teacher's role evolving to that of a learning coach, the content expert, and the overall facilitator of learning. What does this mean? Less time spent by teachers giving monolithic, one-size-fits-all instruction, and more time spent giving deep, meaningful, one-on-one -on -one instruction. What else does this mean? Students learning math and other subjects at home, not only because they're assigned to, but because they want to. In summary, in the next 10 years, I believe that games will positively transform the way K-12 students learn for four major reasons. First, today's kids play games more than ever, so they'll need to be engaged in new and profound ways. Second, the next generation teachers play games more than ever, so they'll be much more comfortable playing games. Third, technology advancement will finally allow and support the implementation of games in the classroom. And finally, the benefits that games can bring into learning will be too valuable to disregard. So I'm extremely excited about the next decade in education, and I look forward to being part of this positive transformation, and I hope you all do too. Thank you.